Providence College basketball game, the State of the State address. Uh, we were joking that nothing has really gone on in our lives since March 13th, and now tonight everything's happening at once. But I promise we'll try to make this um, as quick as possible while still covering all the material we want to cover. Um, I do have questions that people sent in ahead of time, and then we'll open the, the chat will be open for questions um, at the end, uh, just to, uh, to, in case we don't cover some of your questions. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. All right, so I'd like to officially welcome all of you to College Planning Night 2021. Uh, we have uh, quite a few people out in the audience. Uh, I know I opened this up for students in, and parents in grades 9 through 12. I suspect we have a lot of 11th grade parents out there, um, as well as 11th graders. We did have a presentation for the 11th graders on Monday as well. That presentation has been recorded and posted on my YouTube channel, so if some students couldn't make it, they can certainly uh, check that one out. That presentation was a little bit more all-encompassing regarding post-high school planning, so we spoke not just about the college process, but about career searches as well. And we do stress that all students should have a plan for uh, leaving high school. They should. We, we, we want to meet with them to develop that plan, whatever it might be, whether it be a four-year college, a two-year college, the military, um, a trade school, regardless of what that is. Tonight's presentation, though, is really focusing on the college planning process and not to diminish the others, but there are a lot of moving pieces to this process, so we're talking about that as well. Um, last year, we started opening up the presentation to other families in grades 9 and 10. Um, just because it's come to our attention, a lot of people have mentioned it's really helpful to kind of know what the process is ahead of time. It can make a difference sometimes um, in your course planning as you're planning, starting to select courses for the future following year. Uh, when we're able to travel again, if you're starting to think about this process and you happen to be on a family vacation that's near a university, you can stop in and visit. So I think getting a head start and just thinking about it and maybe a non-stressful way in ninth and 10th grade is a great idea. So as we get started, some things to consider. Oh, and before I get started, sorry, we do have a guest speaker, um, Nancy Egan from Providence College. I know on the agenda that I sent out, it said she was gonna be speaking first, but we actually have kind of embedded her later on in the presentation. So I'll be speaking, then she'll speak, and then they'll go back to me. So um, just to let everybody know, we're, we're going to deviate from the um, agenda a little bit, but we still are gonna cover everything that's on the agenda. So where to get okay. started with this process? And that's kind of one of the first pieces that I, I hear from people. They don't know where to start with this whole process. It seems daunting. It seems overwhelming. Um, so uh, things that you want to start considering. Is my student, or I put am I, if you are the student in the audience, is my student ready academically and emotionally for college? And that's really an important one to think about. Our students, for the large part, are, are ready academically. We do a great job of getting those students ready, even this year, even with everything that's been going on. Our students are rallying. You want to make sure, though, that they're also emotionally ready for that change. Some students need another year at home, and some students are some students were probably ready to go away two years ago. So, or you are ready for them to go away two years ago. So, think about those things and have that heart-to-heart -heart talk as a family. Um, you want to think about budget. Every year we hear about stories of students who get into the school that they really want to go to. It's their dream. And then all of a sudden, mom and dad come by and say, oh, but we, we can't pay for that. And that's an important consideration. College can be very expensive. Um, and there's nothing worse or more heartbreaking to a student to find out that they got into this school, but now can't attend. So be honest about that budget. It's a time in your family to have that honest conversation. How much are you willing to pay? Do you have a mechanism to pay for college? How much is too much? Um, and have that conversation with your student as you're starting to look at colleges. It can make a difference for some of you in that process. Are you looking for special programs? Are there certain majors, certain sports? Are you looking to be recruited or to play a club sport? Are there certain academic supports you might need to be successful? Not co all colleges are going to have all those pieces that you're looking for. So trying to think about what is important to you and what you're looking for will help you narrow that search down. Um, and what qualities are you looking for at a school? Lots of different colleges out there. Lots of different schools that have lots of different options. So think about how big is too big? 
Some students want to go to a huge school until they get on that campus and realize the entire campus is bigger than the whole town of East Greenwich. Some people want to go to a smaller school because they like how East Greenwich feels personalized and teachers know who they are. Some people want to go to a school with lots of activities that are going on. Some students would rather commute to home and, and work at their part-time job over the weekend. Some schools want an active Greek life, some don't. Some want sports and some for some students that's not as important. So think about what qualities are important. And then how far is too far? Parents out there, right now it's very typical for your students to say to you, I wanna go as far as I can. And that is not an uncommon conversation. However, when the time comes to actually go that far away, students sometimes do have a little bit of trepidation. So you wanna think about that. How far is too far? That certainly adds to the cost in terms of transporting your child there and back for vacations and whatnot. Um, so think about that. And even if your child at the, as the process progresses still says that they would like to go far away, I would recommend just as a parent, having a few schools on that list that are a little closer to home, just in case your student changes their mind as the process progresses. Some resources. So you're starting to think about what the next steps are. You're starting to think about what's important to you, where you'd like to go, what you'd like to do. Well, then what do you do? How do you find this information? We are very fortunate to have Naviance, which is a college and career um, software platform that we purchased about a year and a half ago. We launched it last year at this time. Um, and so I, as part of this presentation, I'm not doing my Naviance introduction because I did do that last year, but we will be using that in the junior meetings, which I'll talk about a little bit later. And at this point now, your students should be familiar with Naviance or a little bit familiar. Uh, you'll become very familiar soon. Certainly, if anyone has any uh, difficulty getting into Naviance, you can certainly email me um, later today and later this week, and um, I can get you, get you logged in. One piece that you're going to want to you're going to want to investigate in Naviance is there's a college tab and it's going to have all different mechanisms to search for colleges. Uh, you're going to look at find your fit and there are uh, features called super match, college match, advanced college searches, places where you can start to look up colleges. You can sort them by GPA. You can put in your GPA. In fact, the GPA in Naviance right now is accurate. It's your updated GPA. So it's going to pull all that information. When we get SAT scores, PSAT scores, we load those into Naviance. So it uses that data as well. And you can start to develop lists of which schools kind of fit what I'm looking for. You can put in different criteria. Am I looking for a large school? Do I want to be in the Midwest? Do I want to be down south where it's warm and I can see palm trees? What's important to you? And then the scattergrams feature is probably one of everybody's favorite features that actually utilizes data from our high school, from East Greenwich High School that's been loaded in. There's about three years worth of data in there right now. And so you can plot on that scattergram. This, it will show you based on your GPA and SAT scores, this is where I fit. And then all the green dots around that blue dot, the blue dot will be you, the green dots will indicate East Greenwich High School students that have been accepted to that college. And then the red dots will indicate the East Greenwich High School students that have not been accepted in the past three years. And then you'll see where your dot fits. If your blue dot is right smack in the middle of those green dots, you're more likely to get in. If your blue dot sadly is with the red dots, it's going to be a reach for you. So it's another resource. We'll use that as well in the junior meetings so, to um, acclimate you, but certainly I encourage you to go into the system and play with it a little bit. I've mentioned the junior meeting. We're going to have those. Uh, for those of you that have done this process before, for those of you for whom this is not your first rodeo with this, this whole process, we are still doing the junior meetings. For those of you that are new to the process, we actually schedule, and uh, we're scheduling those a little bit differently. I'll get to that in a little bit later in the presentation. We're gonna be scheduling one hour appointments with each junior, every single junior, whether they say they're going to college or not, we'll have a one hour appointment with their counselor to discuss their post high school plan. We invite parents to that. And we strongly encourage that you come to those meetings so we can just sit down and talk specifically about your student. What is important to your student? And so all the topics will center around your student. Whereas this presentation and the one on Monday were more global in nature, this will be more focused um, and a really great, great way to start that process all together. Another valuable resource, and I sent out a few emails about this already, uh, 
The NACAC college fairs, those are national college fairs. Typically, they're held at the Providence, uh, at the Convention Center in Providence, the Convention Center in Boston. This year, they're all virtual. Uh, but what's nice about that is that you have a lot more dates to choose from. So let's say the Providence date doesn't fit or wouldn't have fit where you are available, you can go on this website, and this is a live link, NACACFairs.org. You can go on that website and you can actually see where all the fairs are and some of the more specific fairs. There are some college fairs that revolve solely around performing arts or visual arts. So you can see where, when those are, are located or when they're being offered, and you can kind of click in and meet with some college reps that way. We do have college reps that come visit East Greenwich High School. This year, those rep visits were all virtual. We're not sure about next year. I'm, I tend to be the eternal optimist, which everyone in the office can agree to probably. I am really hopeful that we will be in full in person in the fall and that those college reps are gonna be coming to our school, but I don't know that. In any case, whether they come in school or whether they're virtual, or I suspect in the future, we might have a blend of both colleges coming from far away may choose virtual visits because they can reach out to more students where some of the more local schools will come in. Regardless, those are posted on Naviance and students can actually go into their Naviance account and register for those rep visits right there um, in Naviance. So it's kind of one-stop shopping. Everything's going to be there in rep visits, college information, scholarship information down the road. Um, and actually I'll refer later on to my YouTube channel in on my, my YouTube channel, I do have directions for accessing some of these features in Naviance to kind of help you out a little bit. The college visits, that's all, honestly going to depend. Opportunities for these visits will vary based on what happens with COVID and COVID restrictions. This fall, those college visits were all virtual, which I know uh, Mrs. Egan is going to talk about in a little bit. Uh, they have improved a great deal from when they first had virtual visits prior to COVID. All colleges have little kind of virtual visits or little videos on their website. And they are kind of canned and kind of their sales pitches. They have really improved those a great deal and they are a much better resource than they used to be. Certainly, if we can get you on campus, that is probably the best, but that can't always happen. So plan early. Uh, Take a peek and see when they're gonna be offered. Some schools may start opening for some limited visits this spring. So certainly if you have a school that you're very interested in, keep checking on their website. Um, it is helpful to try to go when students are on campus versus when they're home at distance learning or in the summertime when they may not be there, uh, but certainly check with admissions uh, and arrange to, um, attend those through admissions. Also go to the info sessions. I think some people like to go to, on the tours and skip the info sessions, but those are really very important. That's where you're gonna get a lot of information about admissions criteria at that particular institution. Um, and those will take place whether those visits are online or in person. If we're in person, like we hope we will be, be prepared for lots of walking. I think after this year, we will welcome being out in the elements and we'll welcome going on that walk, but be prepared have questions ready. And that's true whether those visits are in person or virtual. Don't be afraid to explore the campus on your own, explore the surrounding area. Please, please, please. And this goes for moms and dads too, not just students. Stay off your phone and take it all in. Um, many of us, adults included, have become the master at checking our messages while we're walking. You really want to see what this campus feels like for you, especially if you have the opportunity to get on the campus. You really want to take that advantage, full advantage of that opportunity and stay off your phone. Also, you don't know who's watching you. You don't know if the student that's giving the tour also works in admissions and can say, hey, you know, this, this kid was on his phone the whole time. You don't know what kind of impression you're making. So let's try to make the best one we can. Um, and then after each visit, whether it be virtual or whether it be in person, just take a minute and write down your first impressions because trust me and trust all of us on the panel that have done this before, after a while, they kind of blend. Those visits start to look alike and you'll say, which college had um, this opportunity? Which college had internships? Which college had this huge outdoor pool? It, it, they do blend. You would think you'd remember, but you may not. So definitely write down first impressions. That might be a good time to use your phone to maybe snap a quick picture and write down your impressions. So you can kind of keep those all together. Testing, we've been getting a lot of questions about testing. 
particularly the SAT and the ACT. Uh, many colleges are starting to indicate, so many colleges or most colleges went test optional this year, as many of you might know. We're already starting to get emails that they're indicating they're going to continue that practice at least through next year because it's looking like testing options may be limited. Some, in some areas, they will be more limited than others. And so colleges don't wanna hold that against students. Uh, so keep that in mind. If you have difficulty getting a lot of tests under your belt, it won't be a problem. This year, I had many parents and students come to me, come to the other counselors um, and say, yes, but, yes, but, if my student doesn't take a test and another student takes one and they submit it, they're gonna get in over me. And that's simply not true. When colleges say they are test optional, that's exactly what they mean. They understand. The colleges have been living through COVID the same way we have. And they understand if you couldn't take those tests. They understand if you won't be able to take them next year, okay? That being said, the SAT, I do wanna talk a little bit about that. We are going to administer the SAT during the school day in April, during the week of April 13th. The actual date hasn't been determined yet. We're still kind of, it's probably going to be that Monday, which is an asynchronous day, um, but we also have to plan a PSAT day. So uh, announcements will be coming up about that shortly, but it will be that week of April 13th. It will be in school. I am very confident we will be able to offer that test. We offered an SAT in school um, to this year's seniors in October, and that went very well in terms of COVID protocols, in terms of assigning students to individual desks and locations. They have location numbers and row numbers. Uh, there are no sources of COVID spread from those testing administrations. So I'm very confident we'll be able to do that. And that's actually free for all students, all juniors, because it is part of the state testing um, assessment series as well. Typically, East Greenwich High School has been a national test center for the SAT on Saturday, the first Saturday in June, which this year would be June 5th. I'm still up in the air about that. Uh, I don't know. Again, I am optimistic. Things are going to start to get better, and I'm hopeful for June. The problem with the Saturday test centers um, at our school and at most schools is that those test centers cannot be limited just to students from our high school. We open those centers for students from all over the state. And at least in East Greenwich, we've been very mindful of trying to keep the schools open only to East Greenwich High School students and really trying to keep those numbers of other people, outside people down in the school to prevent COVID spread and keep the school open. Um, so if the numbers are better and I get permission, we will be a test center. I'm not sure uh, at this point. So keep your eyes and ears open. The ACT, due to COVID restrictions, restrictions, we are not going to be able to be a national test center in April. Again, we have too many students coming from other districts and other places um, that we really can't ensure that it's going to be a safe environment for our students. Um, so we're not running the ACT, at least at East Greenwich High School. There may be other locations for that, and there'll be some testing information further on in this um, presentation and, and the packets that you probably got electronically. Um, that we'll talk about that a little bit more and where to find those tests. I want to speak a little bit about the changes to the SAT. The College Board did announce a few changes uh, this week or last week, I think it was. They kind of blend. Uh, the first change is there will be no more SAT2 subject tests, right? Um, I know, well, I think if you, for parents out there, if you're as old as I am, they used to be called achievement tests. Now they're called the subject test or the SAT2s. There are very few colleges now requiring them. And so the college board has done away with them. They're still available at international schools, um, but not in the United States. Colleges will not be using those anymore. The few colleges that were still requiring them, I know Tufts University comes to mind as one, uh, will be taking um, either subtest scores from the ACT or um, AP exam scores in place of that. But those are questions to ask when you visit colleges. If they were asking for SAT2s, what would they take in its place? Or are they looking for anything in its place? The second change is important to note because it is about the essay. On the Saturday test dates, the national test administrations, there will be no more optional essay. All students will take the same uh, type of exam, not necessarily the same exam from room to room, and none of those will have the essay. You can't opt into the essay or opt out. There will be no essay. I say the Saturday test centers because 
the SAT you take in April will have the essay, the essay portion on it. That is part of the state assessment and the state is assessing and collecting data on student writing. So when you take the SAT in the school in April, you will have to sit for the essay part. It is not optional. You cannot opt out. That score will not be, will not affect your college admissions. They're just going to be looking for the critical reading and writing, the critical reading score and the math score. So, but I can tell you typically our students do very well on that assessment. If you think about the amount of writing you do in our school, um, our students are pretty well prepared for that. But I just want to give people a heads up and I'll remind you, you will be taking the essay on in April, uh, that week of April 13th. But if you take the SAT on a Saturday, you will not take the essay. Um, and I just put a little explanation about the differences between the ACT and the SAT. ACT is a little bit shorter and more straightforward. Um, SAT questions tend to have a greater focus on reading and vocabulary and context. ACT has a little bit more of a science focus, um, and just for your information. They're, they're actually pretty similar though. Um, important forms. So this year we've done something a little different. In the past, we've handed out red folders, and, and yes, they were red. We purchased piles of red folders every year, and we pass those out with all the important documents. Um, this year we want to be very mindful of the fact that not all students are even coming into the building so we didn't want to have red folders and expect students to have to come in that didn't feel comfortable doing so so what we've done is we've created virtual red folders and so everyone and this is a live link to the red folder but every family should every 11th grade family should have received a link to that red folder. And what it is is a link to a folder. And when you open it, you're gonna get all kinds of documents within that folder, all the college documents. The nice part about these virtual red folders versus the paper ones is that over time, if I get some more information that's pertinent, I can add it to that red folder and it's a living document. So I can send an email out saying, double check your red folder, there's information on the FAFSA in there or there's information from the college planning center or whatever might come up. So, um, so that I think that will be really helpful to families. Uh, in terms of the actual documents, there is one, one sheet in there, one, dot, one um, kind of document within there that has all of the important college application documents embedded in it. Okay, and those would be our um, cover sheet, We'll go over these in the junior meeting, the parent brag sheet, the student brag sheet, uh, the teacher in-house recommendations, all those forms that you have to fill out. This year, we did many of them as Google Forms. It was a little messy, a little sloppy at our end. Google Forms don't print out well. They come out in multiple pages when they don't need to be. So what I've done in the red folders is I've, I've created copy-only versions of those forms, those documents. So when you go to open, let's say, the student brag sheet, it will prompt you to make a copy. Once you make that copy, that document is now yours and you can type right on it, you can edit it, you can change it in any way you want to, and then you can save it and you can either print it and bring it into your counselor or you can email it back to us. So I'm hoping to make the forms a little bit easier to use, a little bit more user friendly. You can access them all at home and complete them all at home while we still preserve the actual form. In addition to those forms you're going to be filling out, the folder contains lots of helpful documents. I put in there as many things as I could come up with, uh, such as test dates and data, um, eligibility requirements for the NCAA, if you're thinking that might be something you want to explore, so the requirements for Division I and Division II. Uh, there is a list of the college essay topics from the common application and some tips on how to approach each topic. So for the common application, you select one topic. Um, so whichever topic you pick, it gives you some pointers on how to maybe complete that one. Lots of helpful there's information on there for students that might ha have a, a learning disability and how college is different from high school in that regard. So I would encourage you to take some time and really look through that folder and see what's there. And certainly any questions you can refer to us. Um, in terms of the application, and I know um, Mrs. Egan's going to go over this, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time with it. In terms of how to apply, first of all, you may hear about other high schools out there that are submitting applications through Naviance. We do not do that. Please know if you try to submit your application through Naviance, it will go nowhere because we are not using it for that purpose. What happens is if you submit a college application that's on the common application through Naviance, it goes to Naviance, then to us, 
then to the common application. There are really too many steps in that and it's very glitchy. We have heard too many horror stories from too many counselors at local high schools that have had problems with not getting notified that a student had an application due or had the wrong deadline date in Naviance for an early action application and all the applications went out late because the deadline was wrong. Uh, we don't feel comfortable with it. We'd rather they work out the glitches before we explore using that. And so right now we're gonna stick with submitting directly through the common application. Most applications will be completed online using the common application. We'll review that in your junior meeting, but it's kind of a uniform universal application um, that the, at the heart of it is the same for all schools, but most colleges and universities will have a member only page that might just have simple information such as when you're applying, what plan you're applying under, whether it be early action, regular decision, et cetera. Um, some may have supplementary essays, okay? Um, there's a coalition application. That's another form of kind of common application that's out there. It was gaining in popularity for a couple of years, but that popularity seems to be waning. Most colleges will take either the coalition or the common application. If they will take either one, we would strongly recommend the common application because it is more user-friendly. Um, and again, I'll refer you to uh, my YouTube channel. I actually have a description of how to fill out each part with videos, how to fill out each part of that common application. Um, so if you're stuck on that, you can go there. We also have descriptions on our website as well. And we do run common application workshops. Those looked a little bit different this year because of COVID. We're hoping to run those in person again next year. Some colleges still use their own application and there is no, um, you cannot use the common application or the coalition. Those are becoming few and far between, but there's still a few out there. When to apply, that really depends on you. There are many different opportunities in terms of application deadlines. Uh, the two early ones, there are two different kinds of early application. One is early decision and one is early action. The deadline dates tend to be about the same. October is still relatively rare. The October deadlines tend to be some of the Southern schools that have early deadlines and some of those can impact housing options. Typically, most of those deadlines fall anywhere from November 1st, November 15th, December 1st. Um, it tends to be when the bulk of those early applications are due. Early decision is a binding agreement, and we'll talk about that more at your individual meeting. You're signing a contract with that institution saying if you get accepted, you will attend that school and withdraw all of your other applications. This is before you receive any financial aid information. So it's really an important family decision. You can only apply to one college early decision. Although some do have early decision two, so there is an option if you don't get in early decision one, there is an early decision two option, but you can only have one pending at a time. Early action is non-binding. You can apply to as many early action schools as you'd like to. You can apply to them all early action if you'd like to. There, you're under no obligation to attend any of them. So that one is not, not a binding agreement with the college. You can apply to as many of those as you'd like to. Uh, in terms of admissibility, early decision does give you an edge. We've noticed that this year more than ever, our early decision applicants were up. We had, I think this year, about 40, I think we're up to 45 early decision applications, which is up about 20% from last year. And the trend nationwide seems to be that more students are applying early decision, applying to that binding program. And I'm not sure why that is, if it's because of the uncertainty of COVID and people want to be locked in. Um, but we do know that colleges are taking a large um, number of their applicant pool from early decision. And so, if you have a school that's a REACH school and it's your dream school, it could possibly be advantageous to apply early decision. And that's something we would talk about at that one-on-one -on -one meeting. Early action in terms of your admissibility isn't going to give you that edge. A number of students apply early action. And if you are admissible in that early action pool, you are equally as admissible in the regular decision, decision pool. So it's not gonna give you an edge in terms of admissions. However, it will give you an edge in terms of your personal health and well-being. Sometimes getting that application done early is really beneficial to you, to your family. It just takes a lot of pressure off as the year progresses. It's entirely up to you. Regular decision deadlines are right around now, January through early March. And the enrolling decision, you can apply anytime. And as soon as your application is complete, it will be reviewed for admission. Um, the essay, the common application, as far as we can tell, is using the same prompts again as last year. Um, and just to let you know, 
because some, que some questions came up um, in the RSVP about COVID um, and the COVID part of the application. Please, 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 and I'm sure Mrs. Egan will, uh, will reiterate this when she speaks, do not write your common application essay about COVID because they have read a ton of them. Everybody's dealing with COVID. You're not unique. So please think of a different topic. That being said, the common application does have an additional additional COVID question. They had it last year. They're going to have it again next, next year. So there is an opportunity in that application other than in the essay to explain if there has been a significant impact to you and your family um, around COVID, if somebody lost a job, if someone had health issues, um, if there was something that was noteworthy, not just I was stuck in my house and I don't like it. Uh, but something that really was significant that happened that you think is noteworthy and speaks to your progress in high school, then that's the place to put it. In terms of the essay, the com again, begin early and be authentic. Those are my two biggest pieces of advice. I often recommend that you start that essay over the summer. I don't know how many students do that, but I think it's a great idea. And be your authentic self. I think some students get it edited so much and they do so much rewriting on their essay it's not their voice anymore and I really think and I know Mrs. Egan can speak to that as well they can tell college reps can tell when is your voice and they want to hear your voice they want to know more about you after they read that essay than before they read it so keep that in mind in terms of financial aid, I strongly recommend that you all complete the FAFSA. We do get questions from families wondering, do I have to complete it if we're not gonna qualify anyway? No, but I would strongly recommend because you might, your son or daughter may qualify for um, some scholarships and that require the FAFSA. They could, require, they could qualify for student loans, in which case you'd have to complete the FAFSA. So it's still a good idea to complete that at least for the first year, just to kind of see where you stand. It can be done as early as October 1st of the senior year. Um, this is a live link directly to the FAFSA website, but I will tell you, I have a link down below to the College Planning Center of Rhode Island. I would strongly recommend that you utilize their services. They are phenomenal. Our closest location is at the Warwick Mall. You can make an appointment with them and they will complete your FAFSA as well as the CSS profile, which is another financial aid form. They will complete those for you with you sitting right there for free. You will find out in this process that it is one of the only things that you're going to be able to do for free. So definitely take advantage. They are experts. They're wonderful to work with. We work a lot with them. And then local scholarships are all posted on Naviance. There really aren't a lot that you would qualify for now as juniors, but you can certainly go and take a look. Um, they really start getting posted right about now for seniors, but some are open to all grades, so definitely take a look. Um, at this time, you've heard me talk for a while, so I do want to take a break, and I want to introduce our guest speaker. We're welcoming tonight. Um, Nan Thank you, Anne-Marie. Thank you. Uh, we're so fortunate to have you year after year. Um, Ms. Deegan has been doing this for us for a while. She has such a wealth of information. Um, and so we, we always welcome her perspective. I think it's helpful to have the perspective from the admissions office uh, because it seems like such an elusive kind of nebulous position when you send out your applications. Who is reading my application and what are they thinking of? So I think it's nice to get that look into the process. I didn't share the um, chocolate that I have next to me when I'm reading though, but you can envision it. It's important, <laughs> it really is. So a few party thoughts, and then we have a few kind of housekeeping slides, and then I'll take some questions. Um, really, as Nancy said, have fun with the process. It really does work. It truly does. When you hear horror stories out there about students that didn't get in any place, that have no place to go, they truly have not done or gone through the process the way we've recommended that they do uh, we are going to guide you through that in terms of having some reach schools some safety schools some schools that you, most of them will kind of fit your profile of student we want you to have a range of schools but enough schools that we're confident that will accept you and offer you that admission package where you you will have some schools to choose from when you hear about students that don't get in they really have not Done, gone through the process the way we've recommended that they do that. There is a school out there for everyone. Trust me when I tell you that. 
if your goal is to go to a four-year college, there are schools out there for everyone. Have a range of schools. You want some reaches. We never know what's going to happen. Every year we are pleasantly surprised. But also have those safety schools because sadly every year we're unpleasantly surprised. So have a, a range of schools. We want most of them to be in that kind of possible, probable range. Um, and that's where the scattergrams feature of Naviance can be really helpful. But be realistic. You know, we have students that will apply to these ginormous reach schools thinking, well, my GPA will go up by senior year. As much as I would love to tell you, your GPA is going to jump from a 3.0 to a 4.2, it's not mathematically possible for it to jump that much in this short of time. Um, it can go up a little bit, but not that much. Uh, be realistic. Some students say, but my mother went there. My father went there. Legacy does not play as much of a role as you might think because so many of us of students have had parents now who have gone on to college. Unless your parent or grandparent purchased a building that is named after you on the campus, then that's a whole different story and we'll talk after. But for the most part, um, it doesn't play as big a role as it used to. So you do wanna be realistic with the process. You also wanna be realistic with the number of schools you apply to. We recommend every year about six to eight applications. Remember, you do have to pay for each of those applications and it can be pretty costly. So we say that the average at our school tends to be about 10 to 12 applications. Not too bad, few extra. This year in particular, for whatever reason, and we're not sure what it is, there seems to be a myth out there that colleges are going to be more competitive because of the lack of test scores. So you have to cast a wider net. This year, we've had a great number of students applying to 18, 19, 20, 22, 24 colleges. That is not necessary. We won't stop you. You can apply to as many schools as you'd like to, but the reality is you haven't done a thorough search if you're applying to that many schools. And let's say the stars are aligned and out of 20 applications, you get into 18. How are you going to make that decision at that point? You really haven't narrowed yourself down. So you wanna be thoughtful. And I think starting with a large list is great, but you do wanna to work to narrow that down. And those are things we can help you do. Begin early, stay organized, um, be prepared for rejection. Unfortunately, I know for some of you, that's gonna be heartbreaking. For some of you, this is going to be the first time someone tells you in a big way, no, it is. And, and it's terrible. And I wish that weren't the case, but unfortunately it is a part of the process. That's why I want you though to have a reach, a, a range of schools. That number of rejection is gonna depend really how many reach schools you have. So it can be a very small part of the process or a really large part. And I would argue as a human being, as a counselor and as a parent, I don't think it needs to be a huge part of this process. But that's again, part of that family discussion that you need to have. Remember, no decision is final. Some students get so worked up about making the perfect decision that they work themselves into a frenzy and they don't know and they can't decide which school to go to. You can always transfer. No decision is a final decision. So even if you pick a school as early decision and you go and you're not sure that you like it, you don't have to stay there. You have to go, but you don't have to stay. So according to an article in the New York Times dated um, 2018, so a couple of years ago, about 30% of college freshmen do not return to their initial school for their sophomore year. And I'm not sure why that is. There certainly could be a number of factors coming into play, homesickness, financial reasons, maybe students didn't do a thorough search to begin with. Uh, but keep in mind, you don't have to stay there. So don't fret, make the best decision you feel you can make at the time, but know that you can always change your mind. Um, and remember that every experience, positive or negative, is an opportunity for growth. So if you have your dream school and you don't get in, it's not the end of the world. You're growing from that experience. It won't feel like it at the time, but you will, okay? A um, few other things. Booking the junior meeting. We've made a lot of references, or I have, to the junior appointments. We take a lot of pride in them. We spend a lot of time with them. We think they're very important. Um, it's a very important part of the process. This year, we're doing those appointments a little bit differently. In the past, we've sent out letters inviting you, assuming parents could make it, and then they couldn't, and we had to reschedule. This year, those visits will be virtual. 
at least for parents. Students, if you are in the building and you want to come in for your meeting, you are welcome to, but due to COVID restrictions, parents, you, you're gonna have to be at home. So we can have the student and in, in the office and the parent on uh, a Google Meet, or you can all be home together. Whichever you prefer is fine. Um, so this year what we're doing is we're booking, we're asking you to book your own appointments when you're available using an online portal called Calendly. And I've included here all the links to our Calendly accounts. Um, and I've included as well, who has which part of the alphabet, so you know with whom to make your appointment. Don't worry, as I know some of you are probably frantically writing these things down, taking screenshots, you can do that. But I am going to tomorrow morning when I get in the office, email that list out to you as well. So if you don't remember or you don't grab it, um, it will be available in other places as well. So I will send that out. I'll put that in the, the folders as well, the virtual folders. So you'll have it there. You'll have an email. It's right here. Um, but those are how you're going to make appointments with each one of us. We just ask that you be mindful of your student's academic schedule. So when you're booking the appointment, check with your student and, and find out what does their day look like on a Tuesday. If you book the appointment first thing in the morning, are they missing pre-calculus? And if so, is that a good class to miss? Or should you maybe book it at a different time when they're maybe missing an elective or it's during advisory? Um, so just make sure you have that conversation when you book those appointments. When you go on the Calendly link, just make sure that you click on the one that says junior meeting, okay? Um, and it's pretty clearly marked. Prior to your junior meeting, we do have a few announcements for you, uh, a few uh, tasks for you, I should say. A few things we'd like you to do before you come in and meet with us. You can actually log into Naviance students right now, like tonight, this weekend, um, over vacation and get that done. But uh, we would like you to do those before your junior meeting. There are two pieces of information we'd like you to kind of work on in Naviance. So you're going to log into Naviance, Naviance student, um, and... Um, on the slide, there's an arrow. I don't know if you can see it because on my screen, I'm seeing myself. So I'm not seeing where it's pointing to, but it's really to the student tabs page and the uh, my tasks. And you'll see that on the slide deck uh, when I share it with you. The two pieces of, of um, Naviance kind of homework I'd like you to complete. First one is the game plan survey. And that's really gonna get you to start to think about colleges. If you're planning to go to college, what am I looking for? Do I want a four-year school, a two-year school? Do I want to be far from home, close to home? Are there certain majors I'm looking for? And that information will be helpful for us when we sit down and meet with you. The other one, I think is a great tool for you to start to look at while you, as you begin your process, and that's do what you are. It's based on the Myers-Briggs interest inventory, um, and it's going to be kind of a, a personality profiler. And if any of you have taken this before, parents who are out there, it's pretty accurate. You'll answer a lot of questions that seem kind of silly and you wonder why they're asking you those questions. And then when you get the report about yourself, you're really going to discover a lot about who you are and it's pretty spot on. So I think that's really a nice tool to kind of investigate and do some soul searching before you start this process. So again, you'll log into Naviance student. It's going to be under required tasks. Um, and if you have trouble with that, just email any of us and we can help you figure that out as well. Uh, but this part of the presentation will be posted on my YouTube channel. So if you can't see where the arrow is pointing right now, I'm not sure where you can see us on your screen, um, you'll be able to see it there as well. Um, and then last slide is just our contact information. This is for all students, um, for parents, our phone numbers, email, which part of the alphabet we have in each segment um, of the in each part of the, the year, in each year of graduation, sorry. Um, so that's there as well. I'm going to stop sharing my video. Um, and I have a few questions that were emailed to me ahead of time, but if you do have any other questions, feel free to put them in the chat. And I would ask, I have the other counselors here with me, Mrs. McCarthy, Mrs. Wilson, Ms. Smith. Um, if you can help me kind of monitor that, or if you have an answer for a question, if you want to just jump in. Um, in terms of it being recorded, yes, it will be recorded. Miss um, Egan has asked that we not record her portion because this is kind of proprietary part of the, the um, presentation that she um, has crafted year after year. But all the other parts, my portion has been recorded and that will be on my YouTube channel and I'll email it out as well. So if you didn't get to see all of it, 
or if you um, and when a, only one parent got to see it or the student is at work or at the basketball game, um, you'll be able to see it. Um, so to clarify, um, no, you're going to make, we're not making the appointments for you. So either the parent or the student can log into Calendly and make that appointment. We just ask if you're planning to come together that you have a conversation about that and really decide when you're making that appointment. Don't make more than one, make one together as a family. Um, and yes, you'll get access to the slides and the links. Um, how do you connect to Calendly? You're, it's just the website. So you're just gonna put in that link that's there. I don't believe you have to create an account. I think you can just log in and um, make the appointment. Um, some other questions that I know were sent to me ahead of time. Um, and I'm gonna try to jump around because some of the questions I believe were answered in terms of the common application, um, in terms of changes for, because of COVID. So those have been in there. Um, oh, code for Naviance. No, you do not. Um, oh, Calendly isn't running. I don't know why it's not running. I can check. It could be right now tonight. Um, in terms of the code for Naviance, students do not need a code. Students, you're logging in. It's a, a single sign-on and you have the directions for that in your folder, your virtual folders. Parents, you do need a code. Um, it was mailed to everybody last year, but if you don't have it or you can't figure it out, um, then just email me and I can reset that for you. Um, the April SAT is for the class, uh, the current junior class, class of 2022. So current juniors, um, anyone that is a member of the junior class, you are already registered for the um, for the, the April is SAT, the one that's in school. Um, just to let's see, have I missed anything in the chat? Is everyone's kind of watching yes, watching the chat? Mary, there was um, a question about whether the essay will be included when the results are sent to colleges. Uh, I I believe they will be because I, it's one they they don't separate those scores out but colleges won't be really using it because it's not gonna be in most of the SATs. They're really not gonna use that for admissions purposes. They really haven't used it for admissions purposes that readily anyway. Um, oh, and then there's a question I know about the sophomores and the PSAT. The sophomores can study if they want to. Really, it's just a practice. It's a practice test. And so you don't really need to practice for a practice. The, the PSAT sophomores will take in April is not the National Merit Scholarship qualifying test. That's given to juniors in the fall. So I don't think there's a need to necessarily practice. If you'd like to, you can. Oh, timeline for junior meeting. That is a great question because I forgot to mention that. Um, so we'll be ready to start the junior meetings February 20th, the week of February 22nd, right after vacation. Um, we've pushed it out a little bit. Typically, we started them a little bit earlier, but the quarter hasn't quite ended yet. It's just ending this week, and we want to have updated GPAs and updated transcripts for everybody before those junior meetings, because it's really important, I think, to have that updated information. So we'll be starting them the week of the 22nd, but they will actually all go all the way through March and April. It takes quite a while to get through all of those appointments. So, um, you know, if there's a certain time that you're looking for, I would try to log in sooner rather than later. Um, hopefully that site is up and running. I, I don't know what the problem was with it tonight. It was working fine when I left the office this morning, uh, this afternoon rather, uh, but I can certainly look into that if you continue to have difficulty. So you'll see on the Calendly links when we're available for those junior meetings and when we're running them. Um, um, Marie, yes. the question about um, insight into applying um, to international schools. Um, we, we don't have so much experience, but I have had um, students apply to universities in England. I had a student apply to a university in Ireland. Um, England, I believe they have um, an application that's obviously it's similar, but, but different to the common app. I believe it's called the CAPUS. Um, I don't know what the, the student portion of that looks like, um, but I certainly had no issues as the student school counselor in completing my part of it. Um, so like I said, you know, we don't have so many students applying internationally, but um, from time to time we do, and we don't have any issues in managing those applications. Some of them use the, the common application now as well. Um, what was nice about the virtual rep visits this year and why I think some of, to a, some extent we'll still be using them is we did have some international schools that did offer college rep visits this fall, 
So we had, uh, I think, a university from Ireland, um, a couple of university in France, and they wouldn't ever come to our school, but they offered virtual visits. So and virtual rep visits. So that might be a kind of a nice option as well. Um, someone had a question about gap year. I don't know, Nancy, do you have a thought on that from your perspective? How does that impact the application process? Sure. So um, again, I would put this in this category of asking each college because you are going to get a different response, but generally students are encouraged to apply to your high school senior right now um, to apply. And then when you receive your admission decision, ask if you can defer for a year, defer your enrollment. Many colleges, as long as you make the financial commitment to the institution, will hold that space for you for the following year. There's a lot of concern because COVID impacted so many people's plans that there would be a lot of students who are taking a gap year this year and it would impact decisions. It really hasn't been the case can only use PC as an illustration. We did have more students than normal defer or take a gap year. It was 15, which again, in a class size of over a thousand freshmen is really not a lot, but every school will have a different take on um, allowing the gap uh, year. Have the uh, conversation earlier rather than later though. I also had a few years ago, a student from Singapore who was a citizen there and he had actually had to do years of ferry service. Um, so he applied as normal and just worked that out with the, the college and he was able to go and take, do that military service and then, you know, attend that school. Um, I know a question about if you or no students have been accepted from East Greenwich High School, should that discourage students from applying? Not necessarily. I think you want to look at the data and want to look at, at maybe why that is. Um, certainly it might be a school that could be considered a reach. So I wouldn't say never. Um, somebody has to be the first one to get in, but it certainly most, I'm thinking of a few schools out there that, are, that we haven't had a number of students get into in quite some time and they're pretty challenging schools to get into. Um, and the financial aid piece, it depends. Truthfully, there are some schools that are need blind and some schools that are not. Um, some schools, um, I think especially now, COVID has cost colleges a lot of money, just like it's cost a lot of people a lot of money. There are some schools that are looking to recoup that money um, however they can. So I think it really depends. And I think that's a question to ask when you visit colleges. Are they need blind in their admissions process or are they not? Or will my um, need for financial aid impact that decision? Um, it might be true only in the early decision pool. It might be true at any point definitely ask them because that will be different from school to school. Now, what else also, are people seeing? In the, go ahead. Also, Mrs. Mrs. Flaherty, mm -hmm. um, yeah. some colleges are using the phrase need aware. So they will take a look at your uh, financial aid form and your uh, financial information, any information that's been available to them. Again, because they are being very careful with their budget and to be quite honest, they just don't want to be doling out too much financial aid for them. So check out that needs aware. All right. And again, all great questions to ask when you visit or connect with those reps because it will be different. This process would be so much easier if every school did everything the same way, but they don't. And I think that's what makes every school unique and why some schools appeal to some students and not others. So definitely mm -hmm. feel free to ask. Um, college's interest in geographic diversity, that definitely, it does exist. Um, it's, it certainly plays a factor more at some schools than at others. Um, but, you know, if you are, are for the first Rhode Island applicant to, let's say, the University of Wyoming, it could certainly make a difference if that is a goal in their office to try to represent all 50 states. So, um, you know, something to think about. I don't know, Nancy, if you want to add to that from your perspective. Yeah, the only thing I would add, first of all, it's absolutely true. If colleges want to um, increase their geographic diversity, there may be a, an edge for Rhode Island to want to go to Wyoming. Um, but it doesn't mean that the same admission criteria is no longer going to exist. So, um, and I have that question sometimes from students will say, well, what's your least enrolled major? I'll apply for that. Um, that's another way um, you know, of major diversity. But again, if there still is an evidence that a student can succeed, then that geographic diversity or major diversity um, is really not, not an issue because it's not in the student's best interest. 
Right. Um, another question that was sent to me, I had a, a lot of questions about the essay and the college essay and who helps with that. Um, is that part of the English curriculum? Um, and I can say truthfully, it's not at our school. I know at some schools it is. At our school, it is not part of the English curriculum. That doesn't mean if you go to one of your English teachers that they wouldn't read it for you and review it and give you some feedback, but it's not part of the curriculum. Um, that's that's just where they're at. They, they have a pretty packed curriculum and they have not included the essay in that. Um, I am hoping this summer, last summer, my plan was to run a, a college essay writing workshop. I am a former English teacher, for those of you that don't know that. Um, and I was hoping to do that this summer uh, would be would have been free of charge and then COVID happened and I spent all summer trying to help reopen the school and it really wouldn't have been feasible to have it um, kind of digitally I, I think it loses something so I'm, I'm really still exploring that and hoping to be able to offer something um, that would be available to students uh, my plan last summer also was to start our um, common application workshops earlier even sometimes before the school year started but again um, was a strange year this year so just stay tuned we are hoping to um, to really be able to offer more of that um, should COVID restrictions um, ease up and, and we're able to do that that being said we're all happy to read anybody's essay we truly are um, I read many essays from students that aren't even in my caseload it's just send me an email can I can you read my essay Absolutely. Um, again, be mindful of the fact you don't want it over edited. It's great to show it to a lot of people, but don't have them change your voice. And I know when I read an essay, I look at it much differently than I used to look at essays as an English teacher. Um, I don't have a red pen in my hand when I'm reading college essays. And rather than maybe correct grammar, I might ask a question. What did you mean by this? Or can you explain this to me versus just trying to correct something? Because it wants, it needs to sound like you. It doesn't need to sound like me or anybody else. It needs to sound like you. Um, another strategy I've asked students to use, and, and they've been pretty successful in that, Everybody in our school, believe it or not, can find one teacher they've never had. You feel like you know everybody, it's a small school, but there are some teachers you've never had the opportunity to have for a class. So I'd say before you send that essay in and you wanna give it a final look-see, find that teacher and say, you don't really know me. I've seen you in the hallway. You don't know who I am. You really don't know anything about me. Could you do me a favor? Just read this essay and just answer this one question for me. Do you know more about me after this essay than you did before? They don't have to correct it, just give that perspective. And I think that can help you too, because in essence, that's what they're doing in admissions. They wanna learn more about you. And if they come away from reading that essay, knowing more about you than they did but when the, before they started it, it's done its job. And I think that's a great way to gauge that. Um, are there any other questions? I know there's a question about when to start. Um, if there are parents of freshmen and sophomores out in the audience, I'd say when you're ninth and 10th grade, start small. You don't need to stress out about essays and test scores and SAT prep. I'd say just ha start having conversations. What are you looking for? What are you hoping to do someday? Where would you like to be? Again, if you happen to be near a college campus and you wanna go visit, that's great. Start small, but start having those conversations, but also start planning your curriculum. We're gonna get started on course selection pretty soon, believe it or not. Um, and sometimes, you know, that might matter. Every year we have one or two students that comes to us and says, I want to be a business major. I didn't know I needed calculus. I wanted to do this, but I didn't know I needed a, a, a course beyond biology to be a nursing major. So start to think about what it is you might want to do and look and see how that connects with your curriculum. And if you're not sure, ask us. That's what we're here for. So we want to help guide you in some of that decision making. Um, and I think most of the other questions um, we're asked, we're answered already. There was a question again about um, meeting with us and you'll be doing it through the junior meeting. Please know the junior meeting is not the only time you can meet with us. It is the time that we have set aside to have that, that one hour devoted to you for that purpose. At any point after that, you can meet with us. You can um, email us questions. Mom and dad, you can come back again in for in, in the fall for a quick chat. I'm not sure we can do a whole other hour unless we need to, um, but you won't need to. You'll have done quite a bit of research at that point. Reach out, call us, email us. We can do Google Meets. So we are here to walk you through this process in as much help as you need. 
Some students need a lot of handholding through this process. There are some students that have that will not hit submit on their common application till we sit through and go through every page together. I know we've all had those students and some feel very comfortable and confident. So whatever you need us for, that's what we're here for. So this, this meeting tonight, the meeting we had on Monday, the junior meetings, they're really the beginning of this process. And we're to help, here to help you with every step of the way. Um, are there any other questions that are out there? I don't want to miss anything in the chat. Looks like it's settled down. All right, well, I won't keep you. Um, oh, that's just a thank you. So thank you all for joining us tonight. As I said, this will be posted. I'm going to email it out. It will be posted on my YouTube channel, which is actually in that folder, the link to the YouTube channel. Uh, but if you have any questions that you think about after tonight and after you log off, say, oh, I should have asked this, certainly send me an email, send any one of us emails, um, and we will get back to you with those answers uh, as soon as we can. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again, Nancy. Oh, it's my pleasure. It's good to see everybody. It's good to, good see, to you. see you in person at some point. I know. I know. You know, I am the eternal optimist. I'm really hopeful in the fall. In the back fall. Back to normal. All right. Maybe I can get uh, permission to visit East Greenwich High School this year for a high yes. school visit. Yes. Because uh, I'm so far away. But anyway. I know. I know. She has to pack a lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. All righty. All right.